Good morning and welcome to the 17th session of MAVEN Project's COVID-19 update by physician volunteer, Dr. Debbie Gold, a retired infectious disease doctor and hospital epidemiologist from Kaiser San Francisco. She is joined by MAVEN's excellent physician volunteer panelists, Dr. Hunter Hansfield, infectious disease, Dr. Ramona Doyle, pulmonary and critical care, Dr. Lois Friedman, psychiatry, Dr. Judy and Smith, psychiatry, Dr. Libby Sauter, obstetrics and gynecology, and I'm Dr. Jill Einstein. I'm the director of physician engagement for the MAVEN Project. Great to see all of you today. The MAVEN Project is a telehealth nonprofit that supports primary care providers working at safety net clinics across the country. We do this by recruiting and retaining experienced physician volunteers who offer provider to provider medical consults, one on one mentoring, and customized education sessions. So, Dr. Gold, good morning, and I'll turn it over to you. Hello, this is the video editor here, letting you know that Dr. Gold encountered some audio and visual glitches at this point in the video due to having some spotty connection. So I'm going to leave a free stream of the agenda up here for you to look at to see what you will be covering in the video. I'll go ahead and wait a few seconds here. And we'll launch right back into the video. Sorry for the delay. Okay, well, let's just go, uh, go ahead so we've uh, reached um, some grim milestones in the last uh, week. Um, we have passed the 10 million mark worldwide cases. And again, these are um, underreported by at least a factor of 10. Um, and we are now at 10.6 million cases worldwide, um, over 500,000 deaths. Uh, that mark was reached on Sunday, and we're now at 515,000 deaths. And of course, these are underreported as well. Um, US cases now passed 2.7 million. And the CDC now recognizes or, or has announced that these are also underreported uh, by at least a factor of 10. I think that you can see better what's going on um, right now with these dark purple areas in the Sun Belt um, and in the West, uh, as well as in the upper Midwest here. Um, uh, we are now really exploding cases um, in these areas, more than 40,000 cases being reported a day. Um, Texas, Florida, and, and California have reversed their openings in response to these um, large numbers of cases. And I think we are in for some um, rather dire times. The, this is from the New York Times from this morning, and I think it illustrates much better than my, epide my um, epidemiology curve what's going on right now with this spike of cases. We are seeing cases up here above 40,000 a day, and the highest we ever saw um, was just over 30,000 cases um, back in April when we had our peak uh, nation, uh, nationwide. So this is why uh, this is why there's such concern because the cases are spiking up very dramatically. Our deaths have surpassed 130,000. And if you want to find data for your state, this is the website to do so. And you can also get county level data at this site. Um, the European Union has now imposed travel restrictions starting today. They actually opened their borders, but um, there are a number of only 15 countries will be allowed to um, uh, have travel into the EU countries. Um, they're basically using infection rate um, and credibility of, pub and of public health data to figure out which countries can come in and which not. And they're going to update this list every two weeks, but currently, um, Travelers are barred from the US, Russia, Brazil, and India. But if you happen to be from Algeria or Uruguay or New Zealand or South Korea, you're, you're good to go. Um, these face mask exemption cards have been popping up on there. Uh, you can get one on the internet. And uh, it states that the holder of the card does not have to wear a mask because doing so imposes a mental or physical health risk. Um, it has right here the phone number for the Department of Justice, um, and it, it, it states that there are going to be steep penalties for violation of the um, uh, Americans with Disability Act. And right down here is the logo for the Freedom to Breathe Agency, which sounds like a government agency, but it's really not an agency at all. It's just an internet thing. Um, and so, um, anyway, people are um, 
people are, I guess, purchasing these online. So um, you might be asked about providing one and then you can just tell people that they're fake and don't bother going online. Um, there is methanol hand sanitizer out there. The FDA issued a warning last week about um, these hand sanitizers made by Esk Biochem SA. So you should definitely check and see if your hand sanitizer might be made by this company, in which case you should get rid of it. It contains methanol, which is toxic when ingested, or it also can be absorbed through the skin. Um, there were three deaths and one case of permanent blindness in people who drank hand sanitizer, and this was reported by the New Mexico Poison Control. And um, even though there was a request to withdraw its products from the market on June 17th, the company has made no action. These are the names of the uh, hand sanitizers, so be sure that you do not have those in your home or in your clinic. Um, an update on COVID toes. We talked about this chill blains. There were reports from a bunch of cities seeing lots of um, COVID-19 patients and uh, they were seeing a lot of these red, swollen, purple uh, toes. And some of them were PCR positive. Most of them were not tested and dermatologists were pushing for COVID testing for patients presenting with chillblains. And that study has just been um, published out of uh, uh, Brussels uh, where their uh, cases of, of COVID-19 have been very high for quite a while. And this is a published study um, looking at the association between chill blains and COVID-19, and just to spare you here and move on, um, they did nasopharyngeal PCRs on 31 patients. They were all negative. There were 22 skin biopsies looking for uh, uh, looking for SARS-CoV-2 by PCR, all negative, and nobody had antibody titers. So I think that puts the nail in the coffin on the association between um, chill blains and COVID-19. Just a word about pooled testing. This is something that blood banks have been doing for a long time for HIV. Um, I suspect they probably do it for, um, um, oh, I can't remember the name of that. Anyway, it's also done for malaria um, and other sort of low, um, low prevalence infections in the population. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Yeah. Debbie, anyway. if, you can repeat, if you can repeat the last sentence. Okay, so batch testing has been done by uh, blood banks for a long time where they'll take a lot of specimens and test for HIV. It's also been done for malaria and some other um, infections. And what it involves is just batching several samples at once using a single test. In this case, we're talking about a PCR test. And this is already being done in Germany and Israel and Wuhan, China, um, to try and conserve resources. So if this, is, if this works, this could allow a regular uh, screening of asymptomatic people, say in a workplace or a congregate setting, um, and could also be a method for early outbreak detection. But there are problems with this, and, and the problems stem from the samples being diluted, so there's a risk of false negative. So if you have a high prevalence uh, area, this really isn't going to work, but low prevalence communities, it might be helpful. The lower the prevalence, the larger the pool that you can use, and the Nebraska State Public Health Lab has an app that will tell you, based on your community prevalence, how big your pool can be. So the FDA is encouraging this and has posted testing validation requirements um, for com PCR uh, companies so that they can um, uh, offer their tests to be val that are validated for pooled testing. But we still are facing the problems of swab and reagent shortages and too few testing sites. So um, this may not, this is not going to solve the problem of testing. Just briefly, the C is, CDC has recommended. Uh, formal recommendations for people who are at increased risk, who want to go out into public places, visit with family and friends, and participate in events. And um, the guidance really hasn't changed, but it's just directed at this. And here's the website if you want to direct patients to it or take a look yourself. The CDC has revised its list of medical conditions that confer severe risk for COVID-19. They did this last Friday. So on the list now are chronic kidney disease, COPD, immunosuppression for solid organ transplant only, um, CHF and coronary disease and cardiomyopathy. 
diabetes, and sickle cell is now on that list. Um, and they have also revised the list of medical conditions that might confer risk for COVID-19. So hypertension is on that list, as well as stroke, um, asthma, but only moderate to severe, type 1 diabetes, and then immunocompromised, including bone marrow transplant, HIV, and other immunosuppressive drugs. Dementia is on the list, liver disease. Um, and our pregnancy is now on that list, and I want to say a word about pregnancy. Um, this is data from the CDC that uh, is looking at um, pregnant women uh, by race between January and June 23rd. And you can see that um, Hispanic and Latina women um, and Black women are very overrepresented in the population of um, uh, COVID-19 pregnant women compared to their uh, representation in the general population. And um, these data are, um, the, the CDC actually has looked at the risk for hospitalization, ICU admission, ventilation requirement, and death among women who have SARS-CoV-2 infection and are pregnant. Their data for pregnancy for lots of things was very, um, was very um, incomplete early on, but I think they've improved their ability to, to um, get this information reported. Um, if you look at hospitalizations, you see this huge amount of hospitalizations for pregnant women compared to non-pregnant, and they were not able to determine the reason for hospitalization because most people do deliver in a hospital. So I think this is really not helpful information because of course pregnant women are gonna be hospitalized more frequently than non-pregnant. Um, but ICU admission, 1.5% of pregnant women versus 0.9%. So pregnant women had a 50% increased risk of ICU admission. Likewise, they had a 70% increased risk of uh, requirement for mechanical ventilation, but there was no difference in um, the risk for death. So pregnant women can get a lot sicker, um, but usually don't have an increased risk for death, which is good. Um, somebody asked a while ago about famotidine, and I had never heard of famotidine being used in the context of COVID-19, but the Infectious Disease Society of America's treatment guidelines does, did mention famotidine, so I took a look at that. And the story is that there were anecdotal reports from China suggesting that patients who were on famotidine did better, had improved survival. Um, and so um, they, these researchers asked the question, does famotidine reduce the risk for mechanical ventilation or death? This was a single center retrospective cohort study that was done in China. There were uh, 84 patients on famotidine, 1,536 who did not uh, receive famotidine but may have get, received a PPI. And they have a single composite endpoint, which was death or intubation at 30 days. And they found amazingly that famotidine decreased the composite endpoint. The uh, hazard ratio was 0.42, which is just amazing. And you know, if it's too good to be true, it's probably not true. In this case, it is probably not true. The evidence, it was a very low certainty and there were lots of problems with the study. First of all, intubated patients are much more likely to get a PPI and not famotidine. So the famotidine patients were probably pushed into a prognostically favorable group compared to the rest. Um, the co-interventions that patients received were not reported in the study and could certainly have affected the effect of famotidine. And then I think that the, the word was out in the community that famotidine did something. So 15% of patients were already on famotidine when they came into the hospital. And so that could have led to earlier co-interventions for that part of the um, study population. And the numbers were pretty low. So there was, you know, the certainty about the effect is low. And then they didn't de-aggregate their um, composite endpoint data. So there was, were concerns about selective reporting and they thought the um, reviewers of this paper thought that there was a, a lot of that publication bias was strongly suspected and um, so I think that the word on famotidine is that it, you shouldn't use it thinking that you're treating COVID-19. I wouldn't give it to patients outside of the context of a formal study and I'm not aware that any is being done. 
Uh, more on remdesivir, it is, uh, can't be made into an oral formulation. So the company Gilead is trying an inhaled form. There was a press release about this last week. Um, they want to administer remdesivir by nebulizer, which means that it could be used earlier in the course of infection, which makes sense for an antiviral. And um, it could be administered in a clinic setting. So um, be, uh, I'd be watching for the results of this study there. We, screening volunteers right now are for a phase one safety trial, which they hope to begin um, imminently. And they're planning in August to do a phase two study on COVID-19 patients. There are some problems that could be anticipated with a study like this on an on inhaled drug. Um, first of all, if you're giving it in a clinic setting, uh, nebulized meds in, induce cough, and so that will introduce a lot of additional infection control measures that would have to be taken in a clinic where this drug is being administered. And then there are some pharmacokinetic issues like which tissues is it reaching, how fast does it take for the drug to reach those tissues, and at what level does it, um, does it finally accumulate. Um, and then don't forget that other uh, inhaled medications that we've tried in the past have failed, like gene therapy and insulin although there are some that we are using um, that do work. So a word about the Oslo gym study. You may have read about this in the newspaper. Um, Nor done, uh, Norway ordered all gyms closed March 12th. And so uh, they want to reopen those gyms. And in, in anticipation of doing so, these researchers asked, are people who work out at gyms with modest restrictions at greater risk of COVID-19 compared to people who don't go to the gym? So they looked at um, five gyms in Oslo with almost 3,800 healthy people between 18 and 64 who did not have risk factors. And they randomized them to go, either going to the gym or not going to the gym. There, was a lot, there were a lot of cleaning procedures that were in place, but the restrictions on the people who were attending the gym were that they had to social distance for three feet per floor exercise, which would be like yoga, and then six feet for high intensity, which would be like spinning. They could use the lockers, but they couldn't uh, shower or use the sauna, and they did not use masks. Um, and then at the end of four, the 14-day uh, study period, they did self-administered oropharyngeal nose and saliva swabs for PCR. Their primary endpoint was the number of um, SARS-CoV-2 PCR positive individuals in each study arm after 14 days, and they had a secondary endpoint of hospital admission um, after 21 days. So there were 207 total infections in Oslo over the 14-day course of the, of the study. There was a single infection in a study participant, but that was someone who was randomized to gym use, but ha who had not gone to the gym. And there were no outpatient visits or hospitalizations for COVID-19 in either group. And the author's conclusion was that return to the gym may be safe in a low prevalence community if people follow restrictions. They're currently planning a larger study with a lot more gyms to see if the restrictions are even necessary. And based on this preprint, this, these are not uh, vetted data, not reviewed data, not published. The Norwegian government opened all gyms on June 15th. But there are problems with this study, um, lot, big problems. Um, so no infections in gym goers does not mean that going to the gym is safe, but it means that there's a low prevalence of infection in Oslo. At least that's what I think. Um, you could do the same study in a high prevalence setting, but there might be ethical problems with doing that. Um, and then there, it's possible that people who started at the gym late in the study might have been exposed and it was too early to test them at at 14 days, but they were still infected. And I, I think what we really want to know is what happens when somebody who's asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic or somebody who has really mild symptoms goes to the gym and what happens at what happens then. So I think this is an, uh, an open question and I would not have used these data to open the gym. So I want to um, shift gears and talk about racial disparities in COVID-19. Um, these are some uh, COVID-19, these are some um, race and ethnicity data from the CDC um, showing this, this uh, pattern that we see over and over again that uh, racial minorities have, are overrepresented in COVID-19 cases. These are um, Native American and Alaskan American, why can't I see my cursor here, the, uh, uh, or Na Alaskan Natives, um, Black, 
and Hispanic Latino patients. Um, and then these are non-Hispanic white. So that's uh, a comparison. So these groups are way overrepresented in COVID-19 patients. Um, these are some data for COVID-19 deaths that have been normalized per 100,000 population. And um, these are indigenous populations, Asian. Uh, these are black uh, Americans, uh, Latino, white, and Pacific Islander. And you can see that black Americans are way out in front of all other groups as far as COVID-19 deaths. Um, if you look at the District of Columbia, comparing black to white, you see this is like six times the rate of death compared to white for the white population. Going farther south, this is Louisiana, and I'm showing you this because I'm going to show you some other data from Louisiana. Um, the, uh, this is like two and a half times uh, in the black population compared to the white and uh, Latinos in the middle. This is New York, even uh, there, the same kind of disparity is seen, although uh, Latino deaths are, are higher, significantly higher than white there. Um, this is the Midwest, upper Midwest, Michigan, a huge disparity in black and white, and even in California also, this big disparity, although less so, um, with um, Latinos pretty consistently being close to white uh, as far as deaths per 100,000. Um, so if you put this another way, if they had died of COVID-19 at the same rate as white Americans, at least 15,000 black Americans, 1,500 Latino Americans, and 250 indigenous Americans would still be alive as of January 20, of June 23rd. So this was a study that was published in Clinical Infectious Diseases and really shows how complicated this um, subject of uh, racial disparity is in minority communities. There are so many factors that affect health. And um, some of those are, are host factors having to do with chronic diseases and uh, including obesity, malnutrition, poverty, and lack of access to health care and insurance. And then environmental factors include systemic racism, which really underlies uh, housing density, housing insecurity, working in uh, polluted areas, working in uh, frontline industries, and relying on public transportation to get to the to get to work. Um, so increasing risk of exposure. Um, and so I want to, uh, in that context, I want to talk about um, this Oxner Clinic study that was reported from Louisiana. This is a published study in the New England Journal of Medicine that came out last week. It was a retrospective observational cohort study that asked the question, what is the difference between the rates of hospitalization and death from COVID-19 between black and white patients? And it looked at almost 3,500 COVID-19 patients who were confirmed with PCR positive, positive tests, um, and their primary endpoints were hospitalization and in-hospital death. Um, so a word about black patients in uh, this part of Louisiana. The Oxner population uh, was 31% black, but hospital admissions, 77% were black. ICU admissions, 80% were black. Mechanical ventilation requirement, 82% were black. And their death rate was 71% black. So this is, a, this is a huge problem that they tried to tease out. Um, and if you look at their data for patients who were hospitalized, so the number for uh, whites was very low, or just over 300, and the number for blacks was over 10, what was over 1,000. So um, keeping that in mind, the, uh, the average age was 69 in the white population, quite a bit uh, older than the uh, blacks who were uh, average age 60. And the blacks were also more likely to be female compared to whites. Um, if you look at the kind of insurance people had, 40% uh, of the black population had commercial insurance, and then reflecting the older age group of the white population, uh, almost uh, over 50% had Medicare compared to 43% of blacks, and then Medicaid um, was almost twice as frequent in the black population. As far as residents in low-income areas, also in the uh, black population, uh, they were twice as likely to live in a, a low-income uh, area compared to white. 
And uh, there was an increase in uh, need for intensive care, uh, about 30% of whites, but 36% of blacks required an intensive care, 21% of whites and 28% of blacks uh, required a ventilator. Um, but looking at deaths, 30% of whites died, but only 21% of blacks. So um, looking at, they did some modeling to try and figure out what factors were really important here. So model one looked just at race. And if you just looked at race, black versus white, the risk for um, hospitalization, which is what we're looking at here, was 70% greater for black. Model two took into account not only race, but also sex and age. And if you adjusted for those, the risk for um, uh, hospitalization for black individuals uh, was two, over almost two and a half times that of whites. And then if you took into account uh, comorbidities, residents in a low income area, kind of insurance and uh, whether obesity was present or not, it was still about black people still had about twice the, uh, the risk of um, hospitalizations compared to white. Then they looked at uh, modeling for in hospital deaths. And again, the, the model one was just race alone. Um, it was all, looked almost be, to be protective if you were black compared to white. Um, model two took into account um, age and sex, and there was really no difference between black and white in that, in that um, hazard ratio for in-hospital death. Model three took into account, again, comorbidities, obesity, um, kind of insurance and area of residence. And um, the, the, the hazard ratio for black versus white was just slightly increased, 14%. And model four took into account admission respiratory rate and lactate and procalcitonin and AST and creatinine and all these, like there were a, a dozen uh, um, lab parameters and, and physical exam parameters. And that sort of, again, wiped out the um, race as being a, a factor here alone um, as, as in predicting in hospital death. So I think this really, um, I think it's, it's probably not race alone, although we don't know that for sure, that is driving um, poor outcomes in um, the African-American community and other minority communities. And I think that this is what's, what's driving it. Um, okay. Now, I want to end up talking about um, some postmortem findings in COVID-19. This was a study done at NYU, and um, they asked the question, what can postmortem examination reveal about the reasons for multi-organ system failure and thrombosis in COVID-19? So they did seven autopsies looking just at lung, heart, kidney, liver, and bone. And there were two patients who had arrested at home and then five patients who died in the hospital who were either on therapeutic or prophylactic anticoagulation and all of them were uh, very severely affected on ventilators. Um, and these all, all these autopsies were performed by a single pathologist in a negative pressure room to reduce the risk to other um, members of the investigative team. And basically what they found was clot, clot, and more clot. All cases, regardless of the anticoagulation or intensity of that anticoagulation, had platelet-rich thrombi in the pulmonary, hepatic, renal, and cardiac microvasculature. And the clot appeared to form in situ, anti-mortem. Um, these were not, uh, they didn't think that they were like pulmonary emboli coming from DVTs, although they did not dissect the legs. They had evidence that they were, uh, they were forming in situ. Um, so in the lungs, there were clots in the large and small vessels. They actually saw viral particles in the lung tissue. And there were three patients who had bronchopneumonia superimposed and um, four patients who had pulmonary arterial thrombi. Um, in the heart, they saw right ventricular and neural thrombi. Um, there was a single small focus of mild epicardial inflammation in one patient early ischemic changes in three, but nobody saw the myocarditis, which was thought to be causing arrhythmias and such early on. There was no evidence of myocarditis. Um, patients had ATN um, noted. There were platelet-rich microthrombi in the capillaries and venules of the kidneys, and viral particles were seen. 
Um, the liver, again, platelet, fibrin, microthrombi, um, and um, some hepatic necrosis. And then um, I think importantly in this story, the bone marrow, bone marrow was hypercellular and showed increased megakaryocytes. And then there were also rare viral particles that were seen in the bone marrow megakaryocytes. So there was a lot of clot, and why is there a lot of clot? And these investigators at the University of Utah tried to um, in, investigate the, the quest, that question. Um, I, guess, I think I'm going to sort of eliminate, I'm not going to go over the backstory here, but they asked the question, is there a difference in platelet gene expression or function in patients who are acutely ill with COVID-19 compared to matched healthy donors? And they looked at a, a COVID-19 patients, I think there were 41 patients in all, and they looked at their platelets compared to those of um, healthy blood donors. And they, they found that the platelet counts and size and morphology were normal in the COVID-19 patients. And they looked for evidence of SARS-CoV-2, um, looking for the N1 gene in platelets, and they did not see any expression of sars uh, in those platelets, and they did not see any virions on, on EM of, of platelets, um, electron microscopy. Um, they did a transcriptome analysis. A transcriptome is uh, it's the community of RNA transcripts that are being expressed in the cell at any one time. And this is a new word for me, but I, I kind of get it. It's microbiome. This is the transcriptome. Um, and analysis showed that there were 3,325 genes that were differently expressed by platelets from COVID-19 patients compared with healthy controls. Interestingly, they did not express ACE2, which I think this is the first tissue that I'm aware of that doesn't express ACE2, um, not in the platelets and not in the megakaryocytes. So this is not, these effects are not directly related to um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection of the platelets or the megakaryocytes. They did notice upregulation of interferon-induced transmembrane protein 3 in COVID-19 patients, and this is part of innate immunity that prevents viral entry, and it's not specific for COVID-19, but it could um, be playing a role. They also found increased expression of P-selectin, which is um, a protein found on platelet surfaces in patients with COVID-19, and it's a marker for platelet activation. It increases the association with, between platelets and leukocytes and causes them to aggregate. Um, when they uh, treated the platelets with thrombin, which is, uh, will in, induce cl um, clotting, they did find platelet plate platelet aggregation was increased in uh, platelets of, from COVID-19 patients compared to controls. They also used some other pro-thrombotic chemicals that I didn't understand, but thrombin were good on thrombin. So the conclusion is that um, SARS-CoV-2 infection significantly alters platelet gene expression and triggers robust platelet hyperreactivity, which could help explain the clotting complications in COVID-19. Okay, my last slide. This is a string quartet playing at the Barcelona Opera House. Barcelona lifted all its uh, restrictions on a Sunday, and Monday was the opening of the 2020, 2021 2020, season at the opera. And they had this string quartet playing to a full house of house plants. There were 2,292 house plants. That were uh, that occupied all the seats in the opera house, and so with that, I will stop sharing, and um, I'm happy to answer questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Gold. Um, Dr. Gold, if you want to try to um, start, oh, perfect, start your video. That's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, terrific. So let's go ahead and we'll move to uh, the questions that have come in. The first is, what protocol do you recommend for a small dermatology office if a staff member becomes COVID positive by PCR, either symptomatic or asymptomatic? Okay. Oh, so okay. Debbie, I think we'll have you um, 
So there's a little bit of feedback again. Um, I didn't, I didn't do, do anything, anything differently. So. So. Well, if you can stop your video again, and we'll see if oh, stop stop my video. video. Okay. okay. If that helps. No. no. Is that? that? No. no. Let's see. Hmm. You know, you know, I, I could just answer, answer the, the question. question. I, I could do that in a written form. So that, that would be fine. And so Debbie, I know you're, we're still getting that echo again. And I'm wondering well, if while you- we're, While we're waiting, I have a question for Debbie or perhaps Ramona. Uh, what, what does that physiology of clotting and platelet hyperactivity tell us about why the clotting seems to be resistant to traditional anticoagulation? I'm, um, I'm not sure that it's resistant versus um, they're just the doses weren't high enough. I think that there was a discussion about <clears throat> early on about prophylactic versus treatment level doses of heparin. And um, I think pretty early on people began to think that you just needed more anticoagulant. So a lot of this might be people who were on prophylactic doses like 30 milligrams BID of a low molecular weight heparin. I know that some people have gone to full dose and some people have just upped their, any, their prophylactic doses. This is actually under active study. So I'm not sure that it means that the anticoagulants don't work. I think that just the doses for, uh, that need to be higher. And, and, and I think you know the hematologists have commented these are very, very sticky platelets um, for the reasons probably that um, Debbie elucidated. Thank you. How's this? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, that's better. So Debbie, one thing is just to make sure that your video screen, if you're on your, are you on your phone like still? Um, I'm not on my phone now. Okay, great. That's fine. I think what happened was you had your video screen was unmuted and you were also on the phone. But um, okay. this, this, this sounds good. Great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Um, is anything happening with sewage testing for early outbreak detection? Um, I know that uh, Stanford is working on this and said that they would not have, uh, they wouldn't be up and running for probably six months. Um, I know that there are some retrospective sewage data from uh, Spain suggesting that uh, SARS-CoV-2 was present in sewage uh, in early 2019 and no one believes those data and um, um, so but I, I don't know of anybody who's doing it actively now looking for um, outbreak signals not yet. Actually Fordham University in the New York area said that they were going to start doing that on in their campus to try and detect early groups. This was just on the news. Okay, great. <laughs> Libby, I think that you're also having some internet difficulties. Yeah, it must be something in the... Just a comment, and I was surprised by that. Okay, great. Thanks, oh. Libby. Yeah, you're, um, you're cutting out a little bit, but um, oh, okay. yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's one of those days. Um, next question. Do, um, I don't know if this is, is, do SF testing centers ask for risk factors? For example, participating in protest, crowded social events. Some media claims no increase in infection due to the, due to the large protests, but how is that conclusion reached? I think that um, we don't know about the protests because they coincided with reopening and I think those data are going to be very hard to sort out. Um, just having had a test yesterday, um, I can tell you that they don't ask any of those kinds of questions. They only ask about symptoms. Debbie, um, there was a news report. There was a that's news San report. Francisco. There was a news report uh, yesterday the day before so I can't qualify it more, uh, but either, I think it was New York Times or Washington Post that stated that data are evolving, that there seems to be no association of infection with having participated in protests. Some surveys have been done by public health in at least some cities. I don't know the quality of those data, but like, you know, as we've learned, sometimes these public press reports turn out to be accurate, sometimes not. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. 
I, I saw that as well. I think they identified 50 positives in individuals in various states who had participated in um, protests but had not identified any clusters. I, I think I, we probably read the same thing. I think so. Do race the, the and big, oh, oh, go on. The big home from the person writing the article goes back to the, the, the broader context of risks outdoors versus indoors. I think that remains an open question and the weight of the data sort of are trending toward pretty low risk outdoors in general, but that's, you know, we still need more data. Great, thank you. Do race and ethnicity differences stratified for age show anything interesting? I, I know that the CDC posts uh, uh, race and ethnicity data um, stratified by age, but I actually didn't look at it. Um, but I know those data are there because I, I remember looking at them a couple of months ago. So I'm sorry I'm not able to answer that question. But if you go to cdc.gov and look at their race data, um, it's there. Great, thank you. What is the latest on COVID <coughs> protection, if any, afforded by prior live virus vaccine taken? For example, the TOPV. Um, so there aren't data specific to COVID, but as I presented on the, the science paper last week, um, people are very interested in looking at using oral polio virus as a prophylaxis or means of attenuating the severity of COVID-19. But um, the last time I checked um, clinicaltrials.gov was about a week ago, and I didn't see any trials posted, but I know that there is a lot of interest in it. Um, and they, have, uh, they are pushing oral polio vaccine because it's more available and cheaper than BCG, which was the other candidate that um, was talked about in that paper. Great, thank you. How often do you recommend testing staff working in nursing homes? Every month, every two weeks, or every week? Um, so I, <laughs> I don't know how to make a formal recommendation. I, you know, I think that it, it would be optimal to probably test them every two to three days. Um, and I know that um, CMS has made some specific recommendations about uh, nursing home testing, and I did not read that document. It's quite lengthy, and I, maybe they made a specific recommendation in there, and the CD, it's possible the CDC has as well, but I would say um, testing them any less frequently than every few days is probably not going to be helpful. Okay, thank you. Are there outpatient studies exploring low-dose aspirin for clot prevention, especially in higher risk groups such as COVID positive patients with obesity or pregnancy? I have not seen um, any, uh, any study that's looking at that. Um, there was recently a re-examination of a big Xarelto study that um, shows that maybe there, there will be a decreased risk of clot um, by giving Xarelto 45 days, uh, up to 45 days post-discharge, but that was not done in COVID patients, but I think they're trying to extrapolate the data to the COVID population. Um, but I haven't seen anything specifically about aspirin in outpatients or anyone else. Yeah, and I would just say that extrapolation of the, a lot of this has been done in other entities where people like to think aspirin will be a good enough substitute. Um, a, you know, multiple other conditions. It hasn't really seen that way. So I would just encourage people to wait and see what the data shows, because I don't know that there's a good reason to do it empirically. Thank you. Any comments on the accuracy of Pixel home testing kits from LabCorp? I don't know. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, are HIV positive patients at increased or de decreased risk for COVID-19? So I think that's probably still an open question, although I presented some data a couple of weeks ago from Italy where they looked at their database of 6,000 HIV patients. 
and they found that those patients were no more um, at, at that were not at higher risk for hospitalization, um, ICU admission, or death compared to the general population. However, that population of 6,000 patients was incredibly well controlled. They had, I think 94% of them had undetectable viral loads and the mean CD4 count was something like five or 600. So it was not, uh, that wasn't uh, the population of HIV patients that uh, many people take care of. And so I think the, the it's not extrapolatable to um, less well-controlled populations. And the CDC does consider HIV um, uh, one of those conditions that might confer increased risk. Um, but I haven't seen a study uh, specifically in HIV patients. There may be something out there and I just um, haven't seen it. Uh, Debbie, with your HIV experience, you might want to comment on that there, there's a there's a broad perception, particularly in the lay press, but probably among some health professionals as well, that HIV infected folks are at increased risk of acquiring the uh, various uh, uh, infections, whereas in fact, they're probably not at much risk, if any, of acquisition. It's more an issue of what the clinical manifestation and severity will be. Do you, and, and I, I see no strong reason to think that's likely to be much different with uh, COVID. I think so, uh, but I think that, um, you know, in populations who are not in care, who are, you know, significantly immunosuppressed from their HIV, um, I think that, you know, things may be more severe in them. There's some data to suggest that um, SARS-CoV-2 has a similar effect on T cells um, compared to HIV. And so, I, you know, I... I think that healthy HIV patients who are virally suppressed are probably at the same risk as everybody else, but I think it's an open question about what patients who are not in care, who are not suppressed, who have low CD4 counts, um, those people may well not, may not do well. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just making the distinction between risk of acquisition versus risk of more severe outcome. The latter is unequivocal, the former not so certain. Yeah. Debbie, um, when you were cutting out earlier at the beginning of the q and I know there was a question about the dermatology office and a staff member becoming COVID positive. Did you want to respond to that by writing or would you be able to comment on that here? Oh, yeah. So um, a, if a, somebody who works in the office is positive, they certainly have to, they can't work. Um, and then everybody else in the office has to be tested um, and the test, the timing of the testing should be done in a thoughtful way so that it's not do, done too soon or too late. Um, and then individuals who are um, asymptomatic and negative or waiting for a negative test probably could still work. Um, and um, yeah, and, and you know, I think there may be some formal recommendations about what you're supposed to do in an office when somebody turns positive. But I think that what I just said is kind of a minimum. You do have to test everybody. Okay, terrific, thank you. Um, what is the effect of air conditioning on transmission? I, I think the effect of air conditioning, uh, the question's probably coming from the Chinese restaurant um, study that was published and it wasn't the air conditioner per se, it was the fan, it was the blowing of the air um, that caused uh, the in person at table A to transmit to a person at table C. Um, and it wasn't the air conditioning itself. And um, other than that, I don't, I don't know if, I haven't seen anything specific to air conditioning either increasing or decreasing risk. Okay, thank you. And um, nasal swabs seem to have replaced P swabs. What is the evidence that nasal swabs are as sensitive as nasopharyngeal? Also, if an asymptomatic patient has negative nasal swab testing, could this give them a false sense of security, especially if tested too early? Um, and she said, uh, she, the first sentence should say, nasal should have replaced NP swabs. Yeah, so um, I had testing done yesterday and it was nasal and I thought, whoa. I don't really, should I really trust this? Um, it was a combined nasal and oropharyngeal swab. 
and I don't know what the data are. Um, I don't know what the sensitivity is that uh, of that is, um, and if it's more. I, I did show some data for nasal swabs that showed them to be comparable, but the numbers were really small. And I don't know, and I have not seen large scale data published about the sensitivity of nasal swabs compared to nasopharyngeal swabs or combination of nasal swab and oropharyngeal swab, which is what I had at Kaiser. Um, so I don't know the answer to that question, but I am distrustful enough of that particular combination that I'm having a different test done at a different site today. Great, you'll be able to report, <laughs> report, report on, on that. that. Yes. <laughs> the experiment. <laughs> Great, and just follow up with the dermatology office question if a staff member became um, positive. Uh, Dr. Gurley um, says many local health departments also require closure and deep cleaning after an identified infection in a clinic. So, um, oh, yes, yes. I, and I'm sorry, I should have said that. That, yeah, yeah. And, and you do have to report it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, you know, you have a positive, that has to be reported, and it has to be reported that they're a healthcare worker because the health department will kind of, um, you know, give guidelines about, give recommendations um, about what needs to be done. And that might uh, differ county to county. Great. And then our last question for today, uh, is there increased risk in visiting relatives and children? Um, if so, what should be done and how long? Yeah, I mean, going outside of your house, it presents an increased risk. So, but the guidelines from the CDC that are pertain to people who are at increased risk for severe disease um, say that you should visit outside because the risk is much lower in outdoor venues. Um, maintain six feet and wear a mask and don't hug or kiss um, or shake hands. Um, so it's really all the previous guidelines just put into um, a new form with a bow on top for people who are at increased risk. Um, those, those are the basic recommendations. So Debbie, there have been things written and it's been a few weeks since I've seen this uh, about um, kids and contact with kids, either your own or nieces, nephews, grandchildren, and recognizing that, the, and, and maybe Lois will have comments that, that, you know, this is a tough time for children and that they need the personal touch and they probably need some hugging and physical contact. And there were even some stuff saying, okay, if you're going to hug your kid, here's how to do it. Avoid immediate face-to-face -face and that sort of thing. Do you have any comments on that? And I wonder if if Lois does about about what 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 balance there might be for uh, the six foot distancing issue in particular, if you visit your grandchildren, I I think this is all as with everything else risk benefit ratio. Um, you know, every grandparent, every grandchild has different health risks. So um, I see people being creative in terms of sending virtual hugs online, sending cards. Um, doing other kinds of things where there's not physical touching, but I think Judy mentioned something with, do, with stuffed animals and sort of sharing stuffed animals. So once again, I don't think there's a sort of blanket rule for anybody, um, but certainly sort of balancing our need to have human contact with being safe from an infectious disease point of view is a huge challenge. And um, we can hope that common sense prevails for most. Uh, the ICU is, oh, a, oh, I was just going to say the ICU is another totally different topic, which has become more and more problematic, but that's for another day, I think. Right. Um, I think the Icelandic data are really reassuring that the um, risk of infection in little kids, um, zero to 10, is very low. Um, however, it is kids who are infected by adults and not the other way around. So I think the parents of the child have to weigh in on this too. So it's not only, uh, you know, some grandparents are sort of out and about and might be at risk to infect their grandchildren. And while children generally have very mild symptoms, there's still the risk of the pediatric uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome. So, it, you know, it's just, it, it just depends on what your risk tolerance is. If you wanna hug your grandchildren, 
to realize that there might be risk in both directions. And if you want to take the risk, then, you know, go for it. Great. And then um, just two other follow-ups, again, from, uh, I think, in regards to the dermatology office question. Uh, what about patient exposures in clinic after positive results? And then um, a comment from one of uh, our clinic providers at Eisner Health in Southern California. Our public health department does not require closure of clinics um, when a worker is positive to clean. Although the cleaning probably has to be done. Um, it could be done overnight so you didn't have to close the clinic down. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one, oh, when there's a, a patient who was mm -hmm. positive, that was an unanticipated positive. Well, maybe just what, maybe about the, the, the question is, what about patient exposures in clinic after positive results? I'm wondering if referring to if the staff was positive and then uh, the patients oh. that had been in, you know, had come into contact. Yeah. So, I mean, just maybe thinking about this with a hospital epidemiologist hat on, um, if the, um, I might seek guidance from local public health about what would need to be done if we would need to, if you would need to track all of the patients who had been seen by that provider um, during the day, um, when, during the days when that provider was thought to be infectious. Um, and I guess you'd have to find out how compliant they were with wearing, a, you know, a surgical mask and uh, if they were taking it off intermittently during the day and possibly um, exposing other healthcare workers. So I think you might need to do an investigation and engage local public health to kind of help you figure out um, if other patients need to be called, uh, called to be tested or if other people in the office, well, if it's a healthcare worker, other, everybody in the office would need to be tested, I think. Great, terrific. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Gold. Thank you so much again to our physician volunteer panelists. And I wanna wish everybody a good week, a happy 4th of July. Um, next week, Dr. Gold will be on a, a well-deserved vacation and we're very fortunate to have Dr. Ramona Doyle be presenting on dexamethasone um, use in ICU patients. And we'll also have our panel's um, Q&A um, available to answer any questions for next week. Um, at the end of this week, I will be forwarding you the slides from today, the recording from today, as well as the registration link for next week. We have been sending these out um, the past two weeks, and for some reason you haven't reached them, just to double check uh, your junk mail. Um, sometimes the email is from me, which is jeinstein at mavenproject.org. Sometimes it's in a MailChimp uh, format. Um, so if you um, have not received the link to the slides from the past two weeks, you can email me at jeinstein at mavenproject.org. And I hope that you all have a wonderful weekend. Um, enjoy the holiday break and spend some good time with good friends and family, whether it's virtually or uh, safely socially distanced in person. So thanks again all.